Hello, namaste, and welcome everyone to the Invisible India podcast. I am thrilled today to have author and journalist Tripti Lahiri with us today, the author of a very influential book in my life, Made in India. I'm thrilled to have you today. Thank you so much for coming on, Tripti. Thank you so much, Jessica. I'm really happy to be here and thank you for reaching out. You know, like a lot of people, a lot of uh, Indian Americans or, or people who had come from India to the US, you know, I started hearing in the, in the mid 2000s more and more about how much India was changing and how, um, uh, you know, just how I should really like go back and see for myself all the sort of things from people in call centers and people migrating to the city for new opportunities. But I think after like quite a long gap, I came to, in, to, De to Delhi, where I had lived as a child, where my parents are from, um, and experienced it as an adult for the first time. Um, so I think that this book is really uh, a reflection of kind of learning and relearning a lot about India. When I was speaking to foreigners or speaking to, to people in whichever country we happen to be living in, I think I often uh, said the party line about what India, you know, how India would like to portray itself, you know, about... Um, kind of conveying that maybe a lot of problems uh, were in the past. And I think when I came here and I had to run a household and I had to myself employ domestic help, um, you know, I realized that every day is like an ethical minefield and may, many issues of caste and class and, and fairness are like mm. something still being decided on an everyday basis. Uh, and, and, and as a person with means and privilege, like I... I just became aware of how easy it was to just do things in a in a way that maybe wasn't fair to other people because I wasn't thinking about it or I was just doing what other people were doing as well. An ethical minefield. That is so relatable. And I find that even in my own personal life, I face that every day <laughs> living in India. Uh, so just as a general review, you feature different stories of many kinds of domestic help, their stories, mm -hmm. their struggles, and yet you also tell the other side of the story and you weave in such a colorful analysis of Indian culture as a whole and certain mentalities that pervade and influence the whole like informal industry of domestic help. And I, mm -hmm. I, personally feel like this is one of the best books about Indian culture as a whole that I've read um, because you really incorporate the daily life and the, the, the perceived inequality that we as like as a foreigner would perceive when I come that, that oh, this is it's so simple. It's black and white. There's, you know, casteism and there's this problem and that problem. But as you very delicately embrace in your book, is there are no simple ways to reconcile this. And you either intentionally or unintentionally do a fabulous job at record, just revealing some of those issues mm -hmm. and shine a light even on patriarchy without directly <laughs> attacking. But it, it's just a masterful work and I'm yeah. very excited to talk more about it. So, yeah. Um, it's actually, it's, it's um, interesting you bring up the issue of patriarchy and, and sometimes when coming back to the book, um, you know, I think we had this discussion before in a, when you write a book, there are always issues of like, you know, did I reflect everything that I could have, you know, you know, caste is very important here as well. Misogyny is very important. And, and there are sometimes when I look at some chapters and I sort of feel like I did I kind of fall into the trap of, of, of being like, oh, here are these bad female employers mm -hmm. without really positioning it into um, this is unfolding against a backdrop of, of deep uh, misogyny. This is unfolding against a, a backdrop of um, class and caste prejudices dating back years. And it's so complex. It's very hard um, to even capture it in a, in a single book, as, despite the number, large number of words uh, you were able to devote to it in a book. Um, is it okay if I read a little portion? Um, yes, that would be uh, interesting to see what you choose. Sure. So one of the things you mentioned um, in is the uh, inequality of just domestic work in general. So a 2014 or, uh, study 
an organization for business e economic development cooperation and development report on how men and women in some two dozen countries spend their days found that Indian women do 35 hours of housekeeping chores per week compared to two hours a week for Indian men. In other words, they do 15 times more housework than Indian men, the worst ratio in the study. Uh, there shows that there's this is clearly too heavy a burden to bear. And so outsourcing domestic work is one of women's only options. So um, women obviously rely a lot on house helpers and managing everyday life. And, and there's just more domestic work available that, that needs to be done. So um, did you see that really across the board in the conversations that you had? Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right what you say. Uh, you know, women are really fundamentally dependent. Women of a certain class are fundamentally dependent on domestic help uh, to achieve a certain level of time freedom, uh, to work outside the home and so forth. Um, you know, if like, let's take that 35 hours versus two hours. Um, you know, if the domestic worker doesn't come, somebody still has to do that work. And, and it's not going to be the man, you know, for example, even in my own social circle in the pandemic, uh, I know a lot of people who have like uh, asked the domestic workers not to come for a period and then as a result are doing the work themselves. And I, and I know for sure that it's not broken down evenly uh, between them and their partner a lot of the time. Um, and so I think that's what also maybe lends a, lot, a certain amount of friction and contentiousness into the relationship the women are having because if, if the worker doesn't come, the man will still go to office and do everything and expect that like the home life is gonna get sorted one way or the other. Uh, and that is the woman's problem to solve. So, so yeah, I think female autonomy and freedom in a certain class is intimately uh, tied to um, domestic work and to not being, and as a result, to not be able to maybe be flexible uh, all the time um, regarding the needs and, uh, you know, the needs that those workers have to manage their own uh, homes and household situations and emergencies which frequently come up. And, and mm -hmm. that's where the friction comes up. Let's talk about the haves and have nots. I'm going to read from page 61. Mm -hmm. The walls of Delhi aren't all created equal. They too can serve as markers of class and status. The walls in older neighborhoods where families still occupy the homes of their parents the, the, the homes their parents built, when the world outside the home seemed less threatening and families did not mind if passing street vendors could look over the walls into their homes. Although with the wisdom of hindsight, one has to ask, was it truly a gentler time? Or was it just a gentler time for those at the top of the food chain when a million mutinies had not yet begun to erupt, forcing the haves to build higher walls? Those of us who are really, um, in kind of more of a privileged situation. Is it part of our responsibility to like pay a fair wage uh, to, to continue to see development occur in uh, the working class and in domestic labor? And do you think that kind of the suppression of continuing to keep low wages of domestic labor is is really like keeping one third of India below the poverty line. Um, so yeah, I think you know there are low wages across the board, across professions. Um, you know, whether from white collar to, to domestic work, um, and I think conversely, when wages do rise, which uh, I think in domestic work they have risen, um, at least you know for more experienced workers. Um, that is a, a path to upward mobility. I did meet a lot of people where I could see that the fact that their mothers or, or maybe in some cases grandmothers had done this work, uh, maybe had done it at really pitiful wages, had actually had paid the way for the next generation to, to uh, improve. Um, that, didn't, that didn't actually work all by itself. Like it was very necessary sometimes for employers to be quite actively involved, like to help navigate systems, you know, maybe to help get into schools or to help with tuition. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that there is an onus to, to think about, we, you know, so often in interviewing, in interviewing for this book where I really leaned heavily on family and friends, you know, I, I would hear this debate come up of like, you know, we, we shouldn't spoil the market rate. We shouldn't, um, 
we shouldn't spoil the market rate. We sh- you know, that's mm-hmm. wrong. There's a market rate and we should mm-hmm. stick to it. Um, but I feel like there are so many other ways in India where we don't stick to the market rate or where, you know, mm-hmm. you graduate from a top tech university, um, you know, you're getting just a, a crazy enormous salary. Is that really the market rate? So I, I sort mm-hmm. of feel like, you know, the market rate is not an abstract thing that just comes into being by itself. It's like we all set the market and create the market rate. If, you know, if enough people think, okay, like as a factor of what I earn, I can probably pay more, even though I know that so-and-so would accept less and or, or uh, it's possible to pay less, then you shift the market rate. So I do think... Um, I do think uh, we can have those discussions and thoughts, and a lot of people do actually. And I think, you know, when I when I interviewed people, I kind of realized, you know, that I or my family, you know, we weren't necessarily like uh, pushing the envelope. I met so many people where I realized uh, what they were doing was probably a lot more than what I had thought about to do, uh, whether in terms of wages or in terms of other kinds of help, like getting a documentation or something like this. Or, you know, particularly there were employers who'd help their um uh, their worker through some kind of legal issue, which which is very challenging. You know, like people would think very carefully before doing that because the legal system is difficult. Um, and, but they were doing it because they really did feel that was their obligation. Uh, you know, having benefited in other ways from, from the Indian government or education or so uh, other things.